Just ask, Father, that you would bless our efforts, bless our hearts. God, write these words upon the tables of our hearts. Make us written epistles, read and known of all men. We love you and we thank you. We ask that you bless our efforts now. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, it's really, really good to see everybody. It's been several months, and um, it just went like this over the holidays. But I've been real encouraged by all the support and so forth, everybody's excitement about Bible studies. I, uh, I kind of came into the ministry with Bible studies, and someday I'll tell my testimony of how, how I came to the Lord and how a revival started, and, and it, uh, it, that's how it, I came into the ministry, but it, we started with Bible studies, and it just grew, and it went for four years, and uh, about 40 souls were brought to the Lord, and some churches ended up being birthed out of it uh, over time, and so I love Bible studies, and I trust that maybe being in the Bible and so forth and taking these things scripture by scripture, precept upon precept, line upon line, will be a help to everybody as well. And uh, I was talking to Brother Tim last night, and, or last evening, and Brother Tim said that uh, he, as he and I talked that it would be a good idea that if you've got family members or co-workers or friends that show interest in the Bible, then welcome them to come on Tuesday nights. Uh, just bring them with you. I'll be very, very careful. And, and when I say careful, we're not ashamed of the message, but we do understand that we have terminology that people would not understand or revelation that people would not understand. And so uh, my hunger is for souls. And if we get new people in, I'll be very careful to base everything from the Bible because the message is the Bible revealed. That's what the message is. There's, nothing, there's no fear in that challenge at all. Everything, the, all revelation of the message comes back to the scriptures. And so uh, they don't understand maybe what a prophet is, that a prophet has visited this generation and, and so forth. But I'll be very careful to make things understandable. And then if you see light breaking, then what will what'll happen is we'll work with them one-on-one. -on -one. And then answer personal questions that are on their heart, maybe Bible questions that are on their heart. And I've seen the gospel, it goes from person to person. It just keeps like a chain reaction. It'll go from this one to this one to this one, and it's exciting. So Brother Tim said, let's open up the Bible studies. If you, once again, if they show interest, uh, co-workers, family members, rank sinners, if they show interest, bring them on. We just don't know what's laying there. And I think it'd be a good little outreach for us all. And so I, I, I was really encouraged by that. I'm, I uh, got a subject on my heart tonight. If you just want to take your Bibles. Uh, we, the first Bible study that we did was on the Godhead. And uh, I had a real good response to that. Everyone's really interested in the Godhead. And I'm sure more questions will continue to unfold as time goes but it'll get clearer and clearer. Uh, then we went into a Bible study, uh, The Supreme Authority of the Word of God, Part 1, The Supreme Authority of the Word of God, Part 2, The Supreme Authority of the Word of God, Part 3. We're doing The Supreme Authority of the Word of God, Part 4 tonight, and more than likely we'll do five next week. And um, we've covered the absolute, we've covered searching the scriptures and, and those things, but Tonight, we're going to get into one of the most important parts of the subject, and next week as well. So every part is important, but I think that our hearts are going to be blessed this evening. So if we'll just turn uh, to Matthew chapter 16, and we'll start with verse 13. And if you're not too uncomfortable, we'll probably have Brother David have a mic, and we're going to have some participation here. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. 
And he said unto them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, which means little rock or stone, and upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This scripture is very familiar to us. Brother Branham took this scripture and it became actually one of the key emphasis of his entire message. And it's actually something that you don't hear out in the denominational world. You don't hear it among Christianity. But Brother Branham labored upon this scripture. And I believe that our hearts are going to be blessed by it. The word of God should be a part of every Christian's life. As Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Brother Branham said we should study the Bible every day. He said just like we would eat every day, if we didn't eat, we would grow weaker. We'd get shaky. A day later, we'll get weaker. Brother Branham said the word is the bread for our souls. And spiritually, we'll grow weaker if we don't feed upon the word of God every day. Brother Branham said study the word every day which is amazing. He said, some people pick up the Bible once a year. He said, but we should study the Bible every day. And I think what he meant by that is we don't read it like a newspaper, but we ought to pray and be sincere. If we read a chapter, we ought to really pour ourselves over that chapter and just say, Lord, show me what you're speaking of. Please reveal it to me. Give me something that'll help me today. And Brother Branham said, I never want to get tied down. He was speaking with jobs and so forth. He said that I can't study the scriptures. That was remarkable to me because the Bible said, seek ye first the kingdom and the rest is added. He said, I never want to get tied down, but what I can't study the Bible. And I think that would be good for all of us, whether we're busy in our work, busy with our school, busy uh, as a housewife with kids. None of us are too busy, but we can't pick up the Bible and feed upon the Bible on, a, on any given day. Can you say amen? amen? So we want to make sure we give God first place. And Brother Branham said, you know, he said, how many you study the word of God? He said, you go to a house and you search the scriptures. He said, the elect in their day, they studied the day that they were living. How many knows we're living in the last days? If there, and there's false prophets, there's false teaching, even within the framework of this message if there's ever a time that we need to know whom we have believed, not what we believe, but whom we believe. If there's ever a time that we ought to know what we, need, what we believe by the message and by the word of God, it is now. And so we want to make sure that our Bibles are nice and worn. Isn't that right? And we want to cultivate uh, our love for the scriptures. Turn with me, if you would, to Psalms 112. We'll just start out with a few scriptures until start kind of digging in here. Psalms 112, and we'll read verse 1. You got it? Okay. Why don't we start here? Go ahead and read verses 1 through 3. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches shall be in his house, and his righteousness endureth forever. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord and delighteth greatly in his commandments. We cultivate a love for the scriptures. It's an attitude. We cultivate, uh, it's, it's our attitudes toward the word of God. It's just like if we came to church with a bad attitude, chances are we're not going to get anything out of it. Or if you have a bad attitude towards your wife, chances are you're going to have a bad day. You know, so it's all about our attitude and what we look at the Word of God as. If we look at it just as just a book or just a, something that we got to do, we'll never get anything out of it. But notice uh, the, the psalmist's attitude. He said, he said he delights greatly in the commandments. How many have a love for the Word of God? That is, they could be ever so down, but they come to church 
and they hear the word of God and your heart just starts beating for it uh-huh. or just something about the word. It does something to us. Let's turn to uh, 119, Psalms 119, verse 47 and 48. Verses 47 and 48. And I will delight myself in thy commandments, which I have loved. My hands also will I lift up unto, my, unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. Ain't that wonderful? Just, I've loved his word. God put a love in our hearts tonight for the word of God. Amen. The word deserves first place. 165. Turn to verse 165. Of 119, chapter 119, verse 165. Yep, that's good. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Wonderful, wonderful. Go to verse 1 of 119, and I'll let you read 1 through 6. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole, with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Thou hast commanded us to keep thy precepts diligently. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect unto all thy commandments. Amen. I have respect unto all thy commandments. And we could, we could spend a long time on respect towards God's Word. But our attitude towards the Word is everything. Brother Branham, I'll read you a quote. Brother Branham said, May I stop here just a moment and say this, and it'll go on record because the recorders are going, that any divine promise in the Word of God, if you take the right mental attitude toward any of God's divine promises, it'll bring it to pass regardless of what it is. If God promised it and you show the right mental attitude, God will fulfill his promise to you. That promise is good to anyone that will look at it in that respect. So here he's saying, I respect your word. And I don't think the word of God is something that any of us should ever joke about because we devalue the word like that. Brother Branham always had the people stand at the reading of the word because he was showing respect to it as God in letter form. And Brother Branham had a great reverence for the word. He regarded it as life. And it's only life to those that regard it as life. I want to read this to you too. It it was remarkable to me. Brother Branham said, Now, remember this, dear Christian friend. I wouldn't stand here to deceive her. I'd rather, he said, be up in the mountains. He said, but you got to know what truth is. Like a man just handed me a book a while ago. And he said, and when I took that book, I laid it down on top of the word of God. And the angel of the Lord stood right there by my side and said, you take that off of there. It is not right. He didn't want the book was air. And the angel did not want that book associated with the word of God. And he said, he said, now we will meet at judgment and know that the angel of the Lord stood right there by my chair a few minutes ago, Brother Neville's office there, and made me take the thing away from his word because it's not right. He said, that's right. He said, that's all I know about it. The Holy Spirit knew it wasn't right. See, he said, here is God's word outside of this. Our faith is built right here. Ain't that remarkable? The angel of the Lord told Brother Branham, take that thing away from the Bible. Whoo! <laughs> God help us to cherish it and to respect it and to love it so we can get every divine promise will be ours if we can approach God with the right attitude. Oh, this one is awesome. Psalms 119, verse 161. Where's the mic? Who has the mic? Okay, would you pass it over there? 161. 
Princes have persecuted me without a cause, but my heart stands in awe of your word. In other words, I have high regard for your word, Lord. A holy reverence for the word of God. And then he says, I will rejoice at thy word as one that finds great spoil or great treasures. Ain't that wonderful? The word, we stand in awe at the word. Brother Branham said now, he said, when we come to service, we're sincere. He said, and God will bless the word because we know that God's word will not return void. That the word is not the words of a man, it is the words of God. Let's turn, if you would, to St. John 6.66. And this is where Jesus was saying, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you, so on and so forth. And Sister Ware, will you read uh, 66 through 69? Okay. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus to the twelve, will you also go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that you are that Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen. Now notice Peter says, only you have the words of eternal life. So the word is life to those that regard it as life. Now here was the word made flesh in front of them. And they did not understand except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. You have no life in you. But it didn't matter because the Bible said in verse 69, we believe. And we are sure, we are sure you're the Messiah. We are sure you're the Word made flesh. And it was, he said, only you have the words of life. This Word is not just a doctrine. It is God in letter form. It is life to us that regard it as life. That's why we're here. Amen. This is why we love it. This is why we reverence it. Now notice that I love this scripture. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Acts chapter 5, verse 17. Brother Mike, would you read? Uh, 17 through 20. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go, stand, and speak in the temple to the people. All of the words of this life. Amen. <laughs> you see, he taught that the angel released Peter. And he said, he said, you go out there and you preach to the people all the words of this life. And boy, was life followed just the chapter before his shadow was raising sick people up. Signs and wonders were done by the apostles. They were packing the gospel of life, the word of life. It wasn't just embodied in Christ but it actually went over on the day of Pentecost right into the believers it's the, itself. Turn with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 11, verse 12. If you want to go ahead and pass that mic down. And this is when Peter, same one, Peter goes to Cornelius' house and uh, he's given witness in, in Acts chapter 11. But if you'll start in verse 12 through 14. And the Spirit bade me go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house. And he showed us how he had been an angel in his house, who stood and said before him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter. Verse 14. Who shall tell, these, tell thee words? by which thou and all thy house shall be saved. Verse 15. And as I begin to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them as on us in the beginning. He shall tell you the words whereby you and your house will be saved. And as he's speaking, the Holy Ghost falls on them that believe. If you read Peter's sermon, it's not rocket science. It was simply the gospel, just in its purest form. But while he was speaking, the Gentiles received 
eternal life. They receive salvation. They receive forgiveness of sins. How many believe that this word is life? How many believe this message is life? Absolutely right. And if we regard it in that way and respect it in that way, then it'll bring life to us as well. Do you love the Lord? That's why Jesus said, if you're just writing it down in John 5, 24, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, he, he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. And he won't come into condemnation, but he's passed from death unto life. Brother Branham said in the Church Age book that every true revival that has ever happened in history is because men came to the Word of God. He said, in every age, man fell because he fell from the Word of God. He said, but in every revival, anyone that ever came was because men got back to the Word of God. And it brought forth signs and wonders and healing and salvation to whole nations all at once because this Word is life. It's all about the attitude towards it. Notice this in John chapter 6, verse 63. Verse 63. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh pr profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Amen. Wonderful. What is life? The Word living in you. The Word living in me. If you will, turn with me to, uh, to um, Genesis 1.11. Now death cannot come by the Word. Only life can come by the Word. Death only comes when we uh, hybrid it. When we mix it with man's ideas, that's why the Bible tells us anyone adds one word or takes one word will lose his part from the book of life. So we lose life by adding or taking away from the word. But death cannot come by the word because the word is spirit and the word is life. So in, the, in Genesis 1.11, he said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself. And in the beginning, God spoke his word and he created every tree and every fruit and every vegetable. And what that means is he said, everything that God spoke, whether it was a pumpkin, would repro reproduce another pumpkin and another pumpkin or, or a tomato or whatever it was. Every one of God's words that was original, had life in it, and had the power to reproduce itself. Isn't that right? Because God's Word is eternal. And if it was good for a day gone by, it's good for today. But every Word of God has the power of creation behind it. Every promise of the Bible has the same power of creation as what God spoke in the beginning because God's eternal purpose is behind His Word. How many knows that, that God has a, His will for your life? He has a purpose for our life. And it's found in the word of life. Now, every genuine seed must bring forth of its kind. That's God's command. But you have to watch because Jesus said the word is a seed that the sower sowed. Your heart is a field. And you've got to watch what is planted in your heart. Because if you take a false doctrine into your heart, it'll bring forth death. If you take the word of God into your heart, it'll bring forth life. Ain't that right? And Brother Branham said now, there was a sowing that took place in the 40s and 50s. He said, Oral Roberts, Billy Graham. And he said, and the word has been sown. He said, now the word of God that has been sown, which is the message of the hour, he said, God is going to live in his people. God is going to live in his church. He said, but there's also been denominational seeds that have planted. He said that it's going to produce the world council of churches. Then he said, you be careful what you allow in your heart. And I'll say the same for the message. There's a lot of things that surround the message that is not even remotely close to what Brother Brennan preached. See, this message is the perfect interpretation with divine vindication. It is God. 
This message was sent to restore our hearts. We don't need an interpretation of the message. What we need to do is believe the message, receive the message, and become the Word made flesh. Can you say amen? amen? Now, there were four kinds of ground in the Bible. There was stony ground, and there was thorny ground, and there was the wayside, and there was good ground. Nothing is wrong with the seed. Nothing. Say nothing. Nothing is wrong with the message. Only the ground that it's sowed in. And so the incorruptible word of God could fall in many different places and never have an effect. But with the right heart and the right atmosphere and the right idea, it can come right in and manifest itself and bring forth healing and bring forth victory and it can reproduce itself. How many say, Lord, let me have a, a right atmosphere? Amen. Amen. So we want the seed in good ground. Brother Branham said, when the rain falls, it'll bring forth the crop, but it's got to have the right kind of environment, the right kind of atmosphere. And it's an atmosphere of faith. Every one of us got to create an atmosphere of faith. Brother Branham preached a message called Wisdom Versus Faith. And he said, there are two different kinds of atmospheres in this world. He said, there's only two sources. There's wisdom and there's faith. And he said, now, if you follow those atmospheres, he said, you'll find out, did you ever go to a church where the pastor is real starchy? He said, the congregation will be the same way. He said, it's an atmosphere that brought it. He said, but if you ever, he said, if you, it, they might not believe in divine healing and so on and so forth. He said, but if you go to a church where faith is taught, there will be an atmosphere in that church and you'll be seeing healings take place automatically. You'll just be seeing supernatural things automatically because preaching brings an atmosphere. And Brother Branham said, now preaching the word creates an atmosphere. One church will live and one church will die just by the atmosphere where the word is falling. Wow. So it isn't just the preacher that's preaching. It's the, it's the ground that it's falling on. And that's why I'm preaching this tonight is because it's important, not just the letter of the word, but that we have an atmosphere in our own lives, in our own homes, in our own churches an atmosphere where God can deal with us, that we're teachable, that we're humble, that we're ready and expecting to receive. How many say, Lord, start right now. <laughs> Let me have an atmosphere because I want the word to have an effect. Brother Branham said, the word of life cannot grow in an atmosphere of wisdom. Wow. Be, it's contrary to God. God does not grow in an atmosphere of intellectualism and it just don't happen. He said that it must be an atmosphere of faith. Now there, remember when Brother Branham, and I'll be getting to the heart of what I'm going, so just bear with me. Brother Branham preaches when he, when he opens up the Revelation series. He preaches that when God is speaking to the church, he's speaking to two churches. He said, now we have thought previously that when God spoke to the church, he was only speaking to the ecclesia or the elected body or bride of Christ. He said, that is not so. He said, in the book of Revelation, God is condemning one group and he's praising another group. He said, these are two churches that he's speaking to, which is church natural or church carnal, and then he called the other church spiritual or the elected or the bride. You'll find Brother Branham said, all the way from the beginning to end, there has been two vines. There was Cain and Abel, Esau and Jacob, uh, Isaac and Ishmael, Judas and Jesus, a weed and a tear, a whore and a virgin. All the way through the Bible, we see two churches and the book of Revelation shows that there is a whore of revelations and a virgin bride. And so Brother Branham said, now he's, he's looking at this. He said, God, why would God call the false church that a church? And he said, because the false church is claiming that they are Christians, that they are believers of the word. 
He said, just as Islam or a Muslim would actually follow the teachings of Muhammad, so does Christians follow the teaching of Christianity. He said, the difference is one is nominal, one is spirit-filled. He said, that's the difference between the false church and the true church, that one is nominal and one is spiritual. Everybody with me? This is, inc this is incredible because if we want to be a part of the true church, then we want to make sure that we're in the, in the second category. The Bible says, ever learning, but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. Studying their Bible, memorizing the quotes, ever learning, but never know God. That's shaking. Ever learning, never coming. Brother Branham said, a form of godliness, if you're writing it down, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 1 through 9. We won't turn there. But he says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Because the letter killeth, but the Spirit gives life. Without the Spirit, we're a lost hope. <laughs> Without the Spirit of God to quicken this word to life, we're wasting our time. And then, I'm going to read a quote that Brother Tim was laboring on this weekend. He said, the evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost today is just the same as it was back in the days of our Lord. It is receiving the word of truth for the day that you live. Jesus never stressed the importance of works as he did the word. He knew that if the people got the word, that the works are going to follow. He said, now he knew the way that originally man got away from God was by leaving the word. And when you leave the word, you leave God. He said, thus he is presenting, Jesus is presenting himself to the church of Pergamos and indeed to all the churches that I am the word. And if you want deity in your midst, welcome and receive the word. Amen. How many want deity in their midst? And then he said, if we want deity, then we welcome that word into our midst. Don't ever let anyone or anything get between you and that word. He said, this is what I'm giving you, the word, a revelation of myself. I am the word, remember that. And he says, now we, at, he said, I'm sorry, there it is, Jesus again is the word. Then this word he has left behind on the printed page is a part of him. When you accept it by faith into a spirit-filled life, because he said the word is life. I am the truth, the life, and the way. There it is, his spirit. He is life. That's what the word is. He is the word. So when a spirit-born, spirit-filled man in faith takes the word into his heart, places it upon his lips, it's the same as deity speaking. And every mountain has got to go. And Satan cannot stand before that man. Amen. Woo! <laughs> Amen. And he said, right today, when the church returns to the word in faith, we can say without a doubt that the glory of God and the wonderful acts of God will be right in our midst again. Ain't that wonderful? There is a church natural and there is a church spiritual. And this is why I come out of this scripture. Upon this rock, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it because the church is not built of a, just a steeple and I was in Bruges and I've seen the Catholic steeples. You feel like, like the Catholic church could just stomp you into a greasy spot. I mean, you feel so little. And I believe that they intended it that way is to create these massive, beautiful buildings so big to make you feel we can squash you if you resist us. But you know, that ain't a church at all. That's a morgue. God's church is his people. It's not mortar. It's not brick. It's not steeples. It's not, it's not you know, superficial. But God's church is his people. And he said... He said, who do men say that I am? Some say the prophet, some say Elijah, some say this or that. He said, but who do you say that I am? 
Brother Branham said this was an ignorant and unlearned man that he could not even write. While the priest looked at him and called him a devil and people looked at him and just thought him as nothing, somehow this unlearned man with a greasy fish apron looked at the ministry of Jesus Christ and no sooner than Jesus said, who, who do you say? He said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Who? That moved Jesus. He said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. There's no school, there's no preacher, there's no track. Flesh and blood has not done it. They're not responsible for it. But my Father in heaven revealed this to you, Peter. And upon this rock of revelation, I'll build my church. And no devil in hell can take it from my people. Amen. Amen. Because it's revealed personally to Peter. And salvation was never meant to come in a group, in a church but it was to come to individuals that had the revelation of the word for their day. Ain't that beautiful? Brother Branham said, built upon spiritual revelation, spiritual revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, when God has made him known to you as a person, as a savior, as a redeemer, as a healer, as a king, upon this rock, I'll build my church. That you got to know him yourself. It's not good enough to be around message ranks. It's not good enough to have the kind of pastor that we have, but you gotta know him for yourself. And you can know him for yourself. Ain't that wonderful? I wanna talk tonight on the rock of revelation because this is what Brother Brandon majored on. No matter how much we know the scriptures, men that men could actually memorize the Bible, men in prison do it, they memorize every verse of the Bible and can quote any verse in the Bible and can and not even see serpent seed. And look at the message and reject it altogether. It has much more than the letter of the word. But it's actually the revelation of the word that this message intended to get to the people. And revelation only comes from God and that's the only place we can get it. Can you say amen? Brother Brennan said now, and you, you're familiar with this, but I wanted to drive home. Brother Brennan said, the importance of revelation by the Spirit to a true believer can never be overemphasized. Revelation means more than perhaps you realize. And I'm not talking about the book of Revelation and you. I'm talking about all revelation. It is tremendously important to the church. He said, and then he goes through, upon this rock I'll build my church. And he said, the church is built upon thus saith the Lord. And he said, how did Abel know how to offer the proper sacrifice? And he goes all the way back to Cain and Abel and he begins to show revelation from the very beginning. Two worshipers, both coming to an altar, both offering worship to God. One was received and one was rejected. One was vindicated and one was marked by the beast. We could take a lot of time on that. But the difference between the true and the false is the revelation of the word. It's not the word. It is the revelation of the word that makes the difference between the two. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12, verse three. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by, by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Bible said no man can say Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now you could, Brother Branham used this example, you could pull a drunk off the street and you say, you believe Jesus is Lord? Oh yeah, yeah. He said that ain't what he's talking about. But to, to declare that, that he's your Savior and to declare that Jesus is Lord takes the Holy Spirit to do it. This is the separating factor between denominations, 
and the message. Brother Branham said, I didn't come to build a denomination. I wish I would have had put the quote down. He said, I did not come to build a denomination. He said, I come to build individuals as powerhouses into the stature of a perfect man. Amen. What was the stature of a perfect man? The dwelling place of Almighty God. Uh -huh. Brother Branham came to take individuals and set them apart so God could fill them and use them in his kingdom. Amen. We are, there's only one church. I, by God's grace, when I went up to New Hampshire to drive that truck back for my mother-in-law, I got into a, a, a truck. A fellow picked me up at the car place, and we were going to pick up the truck. And it wasn't, it wasn't five minutes, and we were in religious discussion. And this fellow was studied, and we were just going back and forth, back and forth. And, and I, I really liked him. And uh, he was talking about churches and all of his discontent. And I said, there's only one church, according to the Bible, and he kind of looked at me. I said, Jesus only spoke of one redeemed church. I said, there's 40,000 denominations. I said, that's the work of man, not the work of God. And he smiled. And he started opening his spirit to me. And he, and he was discontent. You can see why people are so confused. I mean, you're saying that, you know, the Baptists are right, or the Methodists are right, or the Pentecostals are right, or the Catholics are right, or the Amish are right. Which Amish? The Mennonite? Old order? Which one? I mean, it just goes and goes and goes. It'll give you a headache. God ain't interested in it at all. God has one church from one people, and the only way to be a part of that church is not to embrace the doctrine, but to be baptized into the body of Christ and be baptized, be born again, which Brother Branham said is the same thing. To be born again is to be baptized by the Spirit. Amen. Ain't that right? Amen. And only then, when you have a spiritual revelation of Christ as your Savior. How many have been saved for 20 years here? Raise your hand. Go ahead, raise, raise it up, Sister Linda. I want you to think back of where you were and your life that you lived before you received the revelation of Jesus Christ. Think about where he brought you from and the drastic change, how it changed the trajectory of your life altogether. We thank God, I thank God I can raise my children under this end time message. But every one of our children need baptized with the Holy Spirit. And this message was sent to bring us into an intimate relationship with God Almighty that we could have communion one-on-one -on -one with Him. Amen. Ain't that wonderful? Mm -hmm. Not to embrace a doctrine, thank God for the doctrine. And that's what we're doing here in these Bible studies is teaching the doctrine. But we want the revelation of Jesus Christ to be in our midst breaking these things to our hearts. Can you say amen? amen? Now, the Holy Spirit is the author of this word. The Bible said the scriptures was written by men moved by the Holy Spirit. They wrote it by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So if the Holy Spirit wrote the word, the Holy Spirit is the only one that can interpret the word. And the Bible tells us that it's not of any private interpretation. Men have tried to do it, but Brother Branham said, the Bible is written in mysteries and only the knowledge of God can reveal it to us. Beautiful. And the Holy Spirit, remember no man in heaven or earth could even look at the book. There was not a man worthy in heaven or earth. Even John wept and John was in the inner circle. John wept. John was not, nobody. Only the Lamb could open that book. Only the Holy Spirit, only God himself can reveal the book to us. Amen, as individuals. Do you believe that? Amen. Brother Branham said this in indictment. He said, you're guilty. With wicked hands, you've took the prince of life, the word of life, and crucified it to the people. Now, what did they do? They didn't know it. Today, people walk ignorantly. They don't know that it's the truth. They think it's an ism, speaking of the message. They don't dig deep enough to get into the spirit of revelation. They don't pray enough. They don't call on God enough. They just say, oh, well, I believe there's a God. Devil believes the same thing. Devil believes more than some people that claim to believe. He trembles. People just believe it and go. But the devil trembles knowing the judgment is coming. And the people believe it and don't pay attention to the judgment that's coming. He said, guilty of crucifying, I indict the generation 
He said, and find them guilty by the same word that found them guilty at the beginning. Amen. Wow. He said, the people, good people, don't dig deep enough in the spirit of revelation. They looked at the message and they just, it's another ism. Just shut the computer. And then Brother Branham said, I'm indicting the world for it. They did the same thing to Jesus. They looked right at it and said, no, uh, pastor said it was false. And did not dig into the spirit of revelation, didn't pray, did not consider, and will answer for it. So this word is not to be handled superficially. It should be everything to us. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? See, so now you recall I mentioned at the beginning of the message, the book that we're studying is actually the revelation of Jesus himself in the church and his work in the future ages. Then I mentioned that it takes the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, to give us revelation or we fail to get it. Bringing these two thoughts together that you'll see that it won't just take an ordinary study of, of thinking to make the book real. It's going to take the operation of the Holy Ghost. It means the book can't be revealed to anyone but a special class of people. It'll take one with prophetic insight. It'll require the ability to hear from God. It'll require supernatural instruction, not just a student comparing verse by verse, though that's good. But a mystery requires the teaching of the, of the Spirit in order for it to become clear. He said, how we need to hear from God and lay ourselves open and become yielded to the Spirit to hear. Amen. Amen. So we want to approach the message spiritually. We want to pray and say, Lord, how, how many understand what Calvary done for us? You know, I, I, I appreciate it. Just recently, I think within the last two weeks, I, I am the same as you. I appreciate what Calvary done for us. But I said, Lord, give me a revelation of Calvary like I've never seen it before. In all of the deep mysteries of God, Brother Branham never got away from Calvary. Never. Because we depend on it. It was Calvary that we were saved. Every man on earth was saved at Calvary. Every man on earth was healed at Calvary. It's a finished work. And, that, and we were included in redemption there at Calvary. How many say, Lord, give me a clear vision of Calvary? And that's only one place. And we thank God, but we don't want it to stay intellectual. We want it to become a divine revelation. And that's the Godhead. How many appreciate the Godhead? But you know, that's something that we say, Lord, I want a clear revelation of the Godhead. I want a revelation of the scripture being my absolute. I want a revelation of the message of the hour. There's so much. Brother Branham said we ought to pray for revelation more than anything else. And I know that's shaking to us all because how many times do we not pray for revelation? And I'm not trying to condemn, but I'm saying that, that God is inviting us into a revelation of the word like we've never had before. Can you say amen? Turn with me if you would. John 16, verse 12. John 16. Let's read 12 through 15. Verses, yeah, 12 through 15. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that, she, that shall he speak, and will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are, hath are mine. Therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. Amen. 
So Jesus said in his own words that the Holy Spirit would actually bring revelation to the church. That the, Holy, the operation of the Holy Spirit is what would bring truth to the people. And it was not just called truth, but the spirit of truth. And that that's what the Holy Spirit would do after he left. Turn with me, if you would, to Galatians chapter 1, verse 11. Galatians 1, verse 11. And we'll read 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ooh, this is years after Pentecost. And Paul, who was a messenger to the church age, never went to Peter to figure out, now what did the Lord say about this? And what did he teach? How long is the skirt supposed to be? And what did he say about hair? He never went to Peter, but he actually went to Arabia. And Brother Branham said there is where he searched his experience with the word. And God began to reveal himself to Paul. And Brother Branham said years later when he met Peter, he said they saw eye to eye on doctrine. <laughs> he said, Only the Holy Spirit can make a man see eye to eye in doctrine. But notice this, it was the revelation of Jesus Christ. And if you watch, the gates of hell was against Paul. He was shipwrecked. He was beat three times. He was stoned. He was persecuted by his own men. Uh, his, own, his own countrymen, rather. And he said, I am persuaded, height or death, uh, famine, nakedness, cold, whatever, nothing will separate me from the love that is in Christ. The gates of hell was against him, but it never moved him. He said, none of these things moved me. See, he had a revelation of Jesus Christ. He had a revelation of the message for the hour. Listen to what Brother Branham said here in the power of God. He said, Moses... Right down, he said, when he was born, they tried to kill all the children. They were trying to cut off God's servant, God's chosen vessel. He said, how they done the same thing to Abel, the righteous seed, how Seth took his place and over there in the Chronicles and the book of Matthew, how they killed all the children. The devil was trying to stop the program of God. He said, but they'll never stop it. They'll never do it. God's church will go on as sure as the world. They tried. They fed them to lions. They burned them at the stake. God's church moved on just the same. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. He said, they'll be against it, but it'll never prevail. They tried to stop it. They tried to burn it out. They tried to feed them to lions. They, they, he said, they tried a lot of things to stop out this old time religion, but it'll keep going till Jesus come. There's no stopping it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Ain't that wonderful? Brother Ram said, when the church disbelieves Satan and believes the revelation of the word, the gates of hell will not prevail against her. Amen. See, it ain't just believing the word, it's disbelieving the devil. You ever fought him? Yeah, we all do. Come in your mind, you're a serpent seed, you're just a mental believer, you don't have a chance. And he'll, but when you disbelieve him and take God's word into your heart, the gates of hell will not move you. Amen. How many want that kind of stand? Amen. Luke chapter 10, verse 21. Luke 10. Who do we have? Okay. Let's read 21 down through 24. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. All things are delivered to me of my Father, and no man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. And he turned him unto his disciples, and said privately, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that ye see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. Amen. Amen. So if the world had, had created a political system to burn every Bible in the world and to shut the gospel down off the internet 
and to do like they did in North Korea, try to keep the gospel from getting to the people. It would never stop the gospel because God reveals himself to individuals just like he did Abraham. Brother Branham said Abraham was a root worshiper, worshiping roots. And he said, and God came and appeared to him one day. And this is, this is not about a church or a doctrine. It's all about you and Jesus Christ and fulfilling the word for your day. Ain't that wonderful that you can have a personal relationship with him? Because he said, no man knows the Father and whom the Son will reveal him. How many say, Lord, I want a full revelation? Amen. Amen. Brother Branham said, the way up is down, that we got to humble ourselves in order to receive. I want to read this to you. He said, now, he said, the book of Revelation shows the Antichrist spirit would come into the church and defile it, making it lukewarm, formal, and powerless. And he said, it exposes Satan, reveals his works, and the attempted destruction on God's people and the discrediting of his word. He fights it. He cannot stand it because he knows if the people get a true revelation of the true church and what she stands for and what she is and that she can do the greater work, she'll be an invincible army. If they get a true revelation of the two spirits within the framework of the Christian church, and by God's spirit discern it and withstand the Antichrist spirit, Satan will be powerless before, and he will be as thwarted today as when Christ withstood his every effort to gain power over him in the desert. Satan hates revelation, but we love it. <laughs> With a true revelation in our lives, the gates of hell cannot prevail against us, but we will prevail over them. We love revelation. I, I love the word of God. I love to see every revelation go from Genesis to Revelations. I love the Godhead. I love serpent seed. You know, I'd talk to, I'd talk to sinners off the streets and show them serpent seed by the Bible. There's no problems. It's normally with church folk that can't see it. But normally a sinner right off the street, they'll look and go, well, it's right there. I mean, I, it's a, I've had them do it. They're like, it's right there. I say, you're right, it's right there. But they've not been indoctrinated to keep them from seeing it. You know, there's nothing to prove. And, and so, I mean, with the, with the sinner, you know, there's nothing to suit. We love it. I don't care what it is. Lord, correct me by the word. I want to be right. I want to see it right. How many want to see it right? You know, it don't quit. I mean, I've been serving the Lord almost 21 years and I, I always find something where I was wrong and I want to be correct. And so, so it's good to be teachable. It's good to be corrected. As many as I love, I chasten and rebuke. As long as we keep ourselves humble where God can deal with us. Amen. Now here, here let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 32. So upon this rock, I'll build my church. And I just love the message because Brother Branham brings the symbol of rock out and how God hides himself in symbols and so on and so forth. And I want to look at this just for a minute. Deuteronomy 31, or I'm sorry, 32, 1 through 4. This is the song of Moses. If you'll go ahead and... 31 and 32. Read chapter 32, 1 through 4. Give ear, give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. My speech shall distill as the dew. As the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, Ascribe ye greatness unto you, our God. Verse 4. He is the rock. He, he, um, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without in iniquity, just and right is he. Amen. He's ascribing to the greatness of God, and he refers to God as his rock. Now, this is a song of Moses, and this is the first time that God is described as a rock. 
And without the message, you just would never see what we see in this. Now, we know that God revealed himself in Iraq in the days of Moses when the people were in a desert place, Horeb, which meant a dry place. They were thirsting for water and they were getting angry and Moses went to God and said, Lord, what do I do? And he said, smite the rock and it'll give forth his waters. So he took the judgment rod, the same rod that he brought judgment upon Egypt with. He should have smited the people because the people were murmuring. But instead of smiting the people, he smote the rock. And when he smote the rock, it began to give water and saved a perishing people. Brother Branham said that was a direct type of the rock of our Lord Jesus Christ. When God could have smote us because of sin, instead of smiting us, he smote Christ. And Christ gave forth his waters on the day of Pentecost and it brought forth life to a perishing people. Amen. 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 So we see God was revealing himself in a rock and it was a type of Calvary's fountain. And the Bible said that rock was Christ and that rock followed them all through the wilderness. So Moses was singing about a rock, but that rock represents revelation. Now watch this. Turn with me if you would to Psalms 18 verse 1. Psalms 18, verse 1 through 3. Yeah, Brother Tony. I will love thee, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I will trust. My buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from all mine enemies. Amen. Now here's David now referring to God as a rock. And he says, the Lord is my rock. (laughs) Now now he's making it personal. And Brother Branham says this in Shalom, 1964, God is my rock. And he said, how many knows what a rock represents in the Bible? A rock in the Bible represents the revelation of God. He said, God is my revelation. The revelation of the word is the rock. He said, now David is speaking, God is our rock, God is my rock. And he said, when God has been revealed, he becomes a rock. (laughs) All right, now I'm getting into the heart of where I wanna go. See, we need revelation in our lives. But when we get revelation, then you become unmovable. And that's what rock stands for, unmovable, unchangeable, unshakable, amen. And when you have a revelation, then that revelation from God becomes your rock. Amen. Amen. How wonderful. Brother Branham said this. He said, that's what the church needs. It's not so much study and theology, but get down to the altar till we pray and have an experience that burns into the human heart, burns out all the dullness, and get a new vision. He said, that's the way the Holy Spirit come on the apostle. Such as I have, give I thee. If anything the church needs tonight, He said, is to bring a fresh vision from the presence of God and let the people see that God still lives. He's still in his church and Christ is returning. What a revelation. How many knows that we're in the second coming of Christ? If you have a revelation of that, then we're not ashamed. The Bible said, my people shall never be ashamed. If we really have a revelation of the Godhead, we're not afraid to stand in front of Trinitarian and say our God is one because you have a revelation from God. If you have a revelation that this message was sent from God, there's not a machine gun that can take it away from you. There's not a lion's den, there's not a fiery furnace. They had a revelation and that revelation became the rock. Man is unstable. I can feel one way one day and feel a different way the the next. I mean, you young people going to college, I'm gonna be a rocket scientist. Next day, I'll be unemployed. <laughs> I mean, we just have ups and downs. I mean, we, you, it can change from one day to the next because man is unstable, but God is stable. We need a rock. <laughs> we need something that we can anchor to that will hold us in our position. Can you say amen? amen. Now watch this. this. This is wonderful. Um. 
<clears throat> Turn with me to Psalms 31. Psalms 31, verse 1. And we'll read 1 through 3. Now remember, these are the Psalms of David. And in the times that David had wrote these Psalms, Saul was chastening. And God had told David that he would be the king of Israel. From the time that he was anointed king to the time he became king was about 10 years of hellish agony. Do you think he needed a rock in that time? Do you think sometimes the devil will get in his head when he's living in the caves of the earth and he's running for his life? you think sometimes he might have doubted what happened or questioned what happened? He needed a rock that he could hold to in a time of trial. And these Psalms is where we pick up the revelation of God. He needed a revelation. I know whom I have believed. I know that God's word will not return void. Go ahead, sis. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in thy righteousness. Bow down thine ear to me. Deliver me speedily. Be thou my strong rock for an house of defense to save me. Amen. For thou art my rock and my fortress. Amen. Therefore, thy name's sake, lead me and guide me. Amen. How many can say, Lord, be my rock? Amen. The world's falling apart. Be my rock. Be my fortress. That's what David was saying. The Lord is my rock. He is my protection. He's my strong place. Go with me to 62. 62, verse 1 and 2. Go ahead. Truly my soul waiteth upon the Lord. From him cometh my salvation. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. Amen. Amen. It gives you, it gives you somewhere to stand. Even in the trials, when you're stripped, when you have nothing left, there's a rock that you're holding to. That's the revelation that God gives. Ain't that beautiful? Next, next uh, Psalm 71. We'll read one through five. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be put to confusion. Deliver, in, deliver me in thy righteousness, and cause me to escape. Incline thine ear unto me, and save me. Be thou my strong habitation, whereunto I may continually resort. Thou hast given commandment to save me, for thou art my rock and fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. For thou, thou art my hope, O Lord God. Thou art my trust from my youth. Amen. Amen. He didn't run to Xbox. He didn't run to any other comfort. He ran to the word, his revelation. Right. And that's where he found peace and stability. Right. Amen. Psalms 69 verse 1. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. And read uh, verse 2. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I am come unto deep waters where the floods overflow me. So here uh, David is saying where there is no standing, I can't touch the bottom. Floods are coming in and I can't reach the bottom. Now go to chapter 40 verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Through 43. I'm sorry, for, through verse 3. He brought me up also out of it, an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock, and established my goings. Amen. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it in fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Bless the Lord. He took me out of the miry clay and he set me on a rock. <laughs> he put something under my feet. He gave me something to live for, something to die for, something, something standing, something solid. Ain't that beautiful? See, that was the same rock. That rock is the same rock that Abraham found, that Isaac and Jacob found, that Moses found. 
It's the same rock tonight, and that's, that's Christ. Brother Branham said that Moses, when he was dying, he said he looked off into the promised land, and he said he waved to Israel, and he said, and all of a sudden, he disappeared. And he said that Satan argued with Michael the archangel over the body of Moses. And he said, oh God, let me die on the same rock that Moses died on. Brother Branham quoted a, a song that they used to sing. He said, if I could, I surely would stand on the rock where Moses stood. He said, oh, that's the rock I want to stand on too. By faith, I want to stand there. That's the rock of revelation. The revelation of God made known to you. Ain't that beautiful? That is your strength. That is your shelter. You'll like this one. Isaiah 26. <clears throat> I love this one. Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. In the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Does anyone have a margin reading on there? Does anybody have in their margins? What does it, what does it say? Say it again. So that's exactly correct. It says, trust in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is the rock of ages. That's where that comes from. And so God is declaring himself as the rock of ages because Brother Branham said, your faith must have a resting place. It must have a place where your faith, because you're going to move. But you've got to have something that will hold you still. <laughs> An anchor of the soul. And that anchor of the soul is not in a doctrine or not in a church that changes or bodies of people that evolve, but it is in something that is unchanging, unmovable. It is the rock of ages. Ain't that wonderful? Eternal, unmovable. Turn with me to Isaiah 32, verse 1. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. Verse 2. And a man shall be as in a hiding place from the wind, and a culvert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. How many knows Jesus is this rock in the weary land? Amen. And how many knows this is prophecy? Brother Branham said the weary land he's speaking of is right where we're at. <laughs> in this world that we live in right now, the end time conditions, it is the weary land. He said, but Jesus is the rock in our weary land. He said, he's our refuge. He said, all these denominations, but yet Christ is our shelter in the time of a storm. You know, he's our cleft in the rock. Brother Branham said, you never want to answer to God for your wrong. You don't want God's justice. None of us want God's justice. You know, just our thoughts alone would be enough to pay for, let alone our actions. We would not want to stand before God naked without blood, and many people will go to the judgment. Brother Branham screamed. He actually said, cut me open. He said, pour hot sulfur in me, but don't let me go to the white throne judgment. He said, tear me apart by inches, but don't let me go to the white throne judgment. That's the kind of descriptions that he made. But let me tell you, you don't have to because we have a rock in the weary land. And Brother Branham said, there is a cleft in the rock that hides his people. And so that's what we want tonight is we want that cleft in the rock. Brother Branham said, now Isaiah described him as a rock in a weary land that's this land, a weary land, a weary time. He said, there's no escape. Get up and go away from it. He said, go down and confess your sins. Believe on the Lord Jesus. Be buried with him in baptism. Rise in his resurrection with the Holy Spirit. It lifts you above the cares and worries of unbelief in this world. And the name of the Lord is a strong tower that we run into and are safe. And he said, what do we run into? 
He said, we run into his word, the rock, the revelation of the hour, the message of the hour. How many believe that? That it's actually a protection from the judgments upon the earth. Turn with me if you would. Psalm 61, verse 1. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will bow in thy temple, in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in thy covert of thy wings. Selah. Amen. Amen. All of us has had a time where we just think, dear Lord, I'm... I just can't describe to anybody what I'm feeling on the inside, the burden that I'm carrying. I, you know, every one of us, you know, we work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. There's sometimes we become overwhelmed, a lot like David in the Psalms. Like, Lord, you know, what will I do? I want to see my mama saved, my family saved, my, whatever it may be. But you know, the scripture said that from the end of the earth, he cried. And he said, when my heart is overwhelmed, Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Amen. Amen. Lead me right to the revelation that I need, Lord. We need him. Amen. We need the spirit of God. It's more than doctrine. God help us. Amen. Psalms 125 verse 1. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. Hmm. Verse 2. As the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth, even forever. How many believe it? (laughs) Glory. How is it that there's a church so unmovable? They're founded on the rock. Amen. Turn with me to John. 1 John chapter 2, 15 through 17. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. That's pretty solid. (laughs) Matthew 7, 24. We'll read 24. um, Through uh, 27. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Amen. Great was the fall of it. There be many a church's fall, many a ministry's fall, many a personal people fall because they were not built upon the word of God, upon the divine revelation of the word. I really, really like this one. Turn to Job chapter 39. Thirty-nine, verse twenty-seven through thirty. Twenty-nine, 
20, uh, 39, chapter 39, 27 through 30. Doth the eagle mount up thy command at thy command and make her nest on high? She dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock, and the strong place. From thence she seeketh to pray, and her eyes behold afar off. Her young ones also suck up blood, and where the slain are, there she is. Amen. Where do eagles dwell? <laughs> On the rock. <laughs> High above the devil, far above all the hurts of the earth. Ain't that wonderful? I like verse uh, 28. That word crag is where my name come from. <laughs> that one's free. <laughs> Everybody love the Lord. Amen. John chapter 3, verse 1. John chapter 3, we'll read 1 through 7. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, the, the same came to Jesus by, by night and said unto, the, unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou dost, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, how can, I, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and, the, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. Amen. Thank you. That word see means understand. He says first, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom. And then in verse 5, he says, except he's born again, he can't enter into the kingdom. And that word see means understand. And Brother Branham said, in order for us to understand the kingdom of God, then God has to come into us to reveal it because it's all by divine revelation. And Brother Branham quoted this. I want to read this to you out of the church ages. He said, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He said, It's evident from these scriptures that no man of himself can, can hear God, that the ability has to be given him of God. That, in other words, the carnal mind is enmity with God. Our thoughts, our ways are not his ways. Our thinking is not his thinking. And every one of us here, if we studied the scriptures or any given verse, we would all have a different idea of what the verse meant. And the only one that could tell us what it meant was him that wrote it. Does that make sense? And so God has to come on the inside to give us understanding. No man can see the kingdom except he's born again. And Brother Branham continues, and he says that all of God's children will be taught of him. He said the evidence is hearing what the Spirit says. The Spirit is talking. The Spirit is teaching. And Jesus said he would do it when he came. He will teach you all things and bring these things to your remembrance. He told us that the evidence or what would happen after being baptized with the Holy Ghost, that, we, that the teacher would come and teach us truth. And that teacher was an inside teacher, not an outside teacher. If the Spirit wasn't inside you, you wouldn't hear the truth and receive it by revelation if you heard it every moment of the day. See, that is the sign of the indwelling of the Spirit in the days of Paul. Those who were filled with the Holy Ghost heard the word, received it, and lived it. 
Those who did not have the Spirit heard it as only carnal men and put the wrong interpretation into it and went into sin. In every age, it is the age of the Holy Spirit to the believer. In every age, the evidence is the same. Those who had the Spirit, the teacher, heard the Word, took the Word, and taught it. The Spirit revealed it to them, and they were the group that heard the messenger for the age, took it, and lived it. That ought to make you shout. <laughs> because you're able to see the things that you see and understand the things that you understand. Turn with me, if you would, Revelations chapter 3, verse 15. And let's read uh, 15 through 20. Who's got the... Okay. I know, <clears throat> I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayst be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayst be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes with thy salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Amen. Amen. I want to look at verse 18, which is, which is specific to our age. He says, Anoint your eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. And the eye salve is the Holy Spirit. And he's speaking directly to an end time people. And Brother Branham said that without the baptism of the Holy Ghost, your eyes will never be opened, he said, to the true uh, revelation of the word. And he said, when we were little kids, he said, we'd sleep up in a, in a cold cabin. He said, there was cracks in the, in the uh, shingles and so forth. And he said that snow would come in on the bed and they would be up on a straw tick. And he said the wind would blow through. And I know, I mean, it used to happen back when I was little. I know there's some people that experience that where your eyes would swell shut from the cold. And, and they had coon grease. Some of you heard Brother Bam say this. He says it a number of times. And he said his mom would heat up the coon grease, which was a cure-all in the family. And they'd say, Mama, Mama, my eyes are shut. And they, their eyes would seal shut with a matter. And so she'd come and take coon grease and start massaging their eyes and it would start breaking up that matter, and so they could see. And Brother Branham actually used that simple illustration and said there's been some cold drafts blowing through the church in this day, all kinds of false doctrine that has blinded the people. And let me tell you, there's a spirit of truth, but there's a spirit of error too. And when you're dealing with error, you're dealing with spirits, and it ain't nothing to play with. Just like websites, uh, disbelieve the sign and all of those things. There's spirits with it. And if you go giving an ear to it or giving your heart to it, it'll actually plant unbelief in your life. You know, Brother Branham said Eve made her mistake when she stopped to listen. So if you have your re own revelation, you search the scriptures, not unbelieving websites. Did you know Brother Branham said the minute that a question mark comes over the word of God, death sets in. The moment, not a denial of the scriptures or God. The minute he can put a question mark in your heart on God, death will sit in right there. That's why if you've ever been into things you shouldn't be into, you'll feel that darkness or dark heaviness. And it can be just a little unbelief. Get away from it right away. Remember when Brother Branham told the story of the little girl that was walking by the dance place? She had been delivered of dancing, real famous dancer. And um, 
she, she was real, uh, real popular for her dancing. She came to Christ and she was led to the Lord. And she told Brother Branham, she, it was when hope was alive. She said, hope looks so clean and I've got so many scars. And Brother Branham was like, just, just believe on the Lord, you know. Well, one day she was going to get a dress and get some goods to make a dress and she was walking by a dance place and she stopped there just for a moment. And she looked in and she started listening to the music and it started sounding good. And she said, maybe I'll go in and witness. That's what she said. Maybe I'll go in and witness to him. And she said, I stepped in. And the next thing she knew, she was in the arms of a man and they were on the dance floor. Brother Branham was uh, at his mom's house, I believe it was, and, um, and a knock come at the door. And Brother Branham said he had picked up a drunk along the road he brought this drunk to his house and he said that uh, he put him in his bed and Brother Branham was sleeping on the other side of the room. Brother Branham said, aren't you ashamed of yourself doing this to yourself? And he's like, listen, you don't talk to me that way. And he said he heard like that. And he said, uh, something must be wrong. And Brother Branham put on his clothes and opened the door. She said, oh, Brother Branham, I'm lost. I'm lost. I'm lost. He said, sister, what's, what's wrong? Talk to me. What's going on? And then she told him the story. She said, I was just walking by the place and I thought I would just witness. And she said, all of a sudden I went in and now I'm lost. I'm... And he said, sister dear, settle down. He said, all I know is the Bible says, in my name you'll cast out devils. And he started praying, dear Lord, we pray for our sister. And all of a sudden the cupboard door started going and, and shaking. She goes, what was that? He goes, I don't know. And he kept praying for her. And he said, all of a sudden, this bat-like creature with hair hanging off its wings rose up behind him like this. And he said, took off flying through the room. He said, that drunk was sitting up in bed. And that drunk took off. <laughs> and uh, he cast the day. It was the first devil Brother Branham ever cast out of anyone. And this demon attached itself to a woman just for stopping for a minute. And just went in for a minute and opened a door to a demon. Let me tell you, it is a spirit of error. And devils get on you and unbelief get on you. You don't want those kind of devils on you. The way to find truth is on your knees. Not by unbelieving websites to people that can't live a life. Can you say amen? amen. You will find Truth by the revelation of the word. <laughs> and you've got to have it for yourself. You love the Lord. Brother Branham said, now there's been some cold drafts blowing through the church in this generation. Are you tired? Can we go just a few more minutes? Everybody okay? He said, now there's been some cold drafts blowing in this generation and I'm afraid that their eyes are frozen shut and are blind for what God has for. And we need the oil of God's spirit to open the church's eyes. Unless she receives the spirit of God, she will go on substituting program for power and creed for word. And she will count numbers for success rather than look for fruit. And he said, the doctors of theology have shut the door of faith and forbade all to enter. Neither will they go in or let anyone else in. He said, we don't need psychology. What we need is the Bible. You don't need any doctor to explain it to you. You need the Holy Ghost to let him in and let him do the explaining to you. So he says here in the book of Revelation, if any man open, I will come into him and I will sup with him and he with me. Do you remember those on the road to Emmaus? When Jesus walked with them, their eyes were closed. They had no clue who he was. They had no idea who he was. But when he got into the room with them and sat down, all of a sudden he broke bread and their eyes were open. It was him all the time. But now their understanding was open and the Bible said he opened their understanding of the scriptures. So many of people have the Bibles memorized but don't have the understanding of what God is saying. Do you love the Lord? Amen. So we want God to open our understanding just like he did with Gehazi. Remember Gehazi, how Gehazi woke up in the morning and he looked and he saw all the Syrians. He said, Master, Master, 
They, they got us surrounded. Elijah looked and said, there's more of us than there is them. Now, they were always there, but he couldn't see them. So he prayed, Lord, open this guy's eyes. And when he opened his eyes, he saw there was more of us than there is them. Amen. See, it takes our eyesight, we see with our heart and not our eyes. By faith, Abraham saw Isaac coming and, counted, and, and he staggered not at the promise of God. He saw that by faith because God opened his eyes. It was a revelation that Isaac was coming. Can you say amen? Moses, by faith, saw him who was invisible. It was by faith that Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. It was by revelation he offered a more excellent sacrifice. It was by faith that the walls of Jericho came down. You could actually go into the book of Revelation and by faith, by faith, you can put by revelation, by revelation, because Brother Branham said faith and a revelation is the same thing. You can't have faith without it being revealed to you. Ain't that right? And so just like your salvation, it must, it must be open to you. It must be revealed to you that there is a door of salvation, a door of healing. There's the Holy Spirit for you. Whatever divine promise God has for us, it takes faith, God, to open our eyes to see it. Ain't that right? So Brother Branham said, we see with our heart. We see with understanding. And faith is a revelation from God. And then Brother Branham said, faith, he said, faith is something that's revealed to you that is not yet. Faith is a revelation of the will of God for your life. By, and he says, he talked to a man and said, we refuse all revelations. And Brother Branham said, then you've got to refuse Christ. He said, because Christ is the revelation of God and the Spirit of God revealed in human form. Everybody with me? And so we want a revelation of our part in this message. We have gifts in our lives and every one of us play a part and don't think that you don't. If God opened your eyes to this message, then you have a part to play. Maybe you're a musician. Maybe you're a preacher. Maybe, maybe you're a witness. Whatever it may be, God knows what it is. But every one of us need a revelation of our purpose here on earth. If you've got breath in your lungs, then there's a purpose for you being here. Can you say amen? There's a reason why we're here. And that'll take divine revelation. Can you say amen? I'll, I'll wrap this up. I think you might be getting a little tired. I want, to, I want to read this to you. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15. Ephesians 1. Let's read 15 through 18. Where's the microphone? Where are we at? Oh, I know you. They read 15 through 18. Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in, in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in, your, in my prayers, that the that God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the in the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know that what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his, inher of his inheritance in the saints. Beautiful. So Paul's praying now for the church that the eyes of their understanding would be enlightened. This is very familiar to us, but how many here want revelation from God? I'm going to read this to you. Brother Bram said, if revelation is beyond you, look up and seek God for it. That is the only way you're ever going to get it. A revelation has to come from God. It never comes by human natural endowment, but by spiritual endowment. You can even memorize the scripture, and that's wonderful, but that won't do it. It has to be a revelation from God. 
It says in the Word that no man can say Jesus is the Christ but by the Holy Ghost. You have to receive the Holy Ghost and then only then can the Spirit give you a revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One. No man knows the things of God save the Spirit of God and to whom the Spirit of God will reveal them. We need to call on God for revelation more than anything else in the world. We have accepted the Bible. We have accepted the great truths of it. But still it's not real for most people because the revelation of the Spirit is not there. The Word has not been quickened. He said now in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians 5.21 that we would become the righteousness of God by our union with Jesus Christ. Did you get it? It says we are the righteousness of God Himself by being in Christ. It says that Jesus became sin for us and it does not say he became sinful, but that he became sin, that by our union with him, we might become the righteousness of God. If we accept the fact, and we must, that Jesus became sin for us, then we must also accept the fact that by our union with him, we have become the very righteousness of God. Watch this. To reject the one is to reject the other. To accept the one is to accept the other. Now we know the Bible says that it can't be denied. But the revelation is missing. It's not real to the majority of God's children. It's just a good verse in the Bible. But we need to have it made alive to us. And that will take revelation. Brother Branham said, she is the sinless, spotless bride of Jesus Christ. Now, every one of us know our own lives and our own heart. And we look in the mirror every day. And how many can say, I am the righteousness of God? You know, that's amazing how Hollywood, how they portray Moses, you know, Charleston Heston. (laughs) <laughs> heroic, you know, muscles. <laughs> no, he had a stutter. God uses simplicity. People like you and I. Honestly, how many can stand up and say, I am the righteousness of God? But the Bible says we are. And that will take revelation. Why are you talking about revelation? Because we need it tonight. We believe that he became sin, right? Right? That part is easy, but the part that applies to us, that we are the righteousness of God, that's where we say, God, help us. (laughs) Me, you, absolutely. We must believe it because God's only taken a bride without spot into the rapture. Ain't that wonderful? Now watch what he says. Bear with me a few more minutes. I won't hold you much longer. No one can doubt that the scribes and the Pharisees and the great scholars in 19, I'm sorry, in AD 33 knew the exact laws of grammar and the exact meanings of the words in the Old Testament. But all their superb knowledge, they missed the revelation of God's promised word and manifested son. There he was set forth from Genesis to Malachi with all the chapters devoted to him and his ministry. And only a few was illuminated by the Spirit. They missed him entirely. Now, he said, we come to the conclusion that we have already found in the Word. As we believe and are trying to find the oldest manuscripts and get the best records of the Word possible, we will never get the true meaning of the study in comparison of Scriptures as sincere as we may be. It will take the revelation from God to bring it out. That's exactly what Paul said. Things which we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Spirit teaches. Now he said, don't let be misled. I believe in the accuracy of the scriptures. He says, but we need the Spirit to teach it to us. How we need a revelation of the Spirit. We don't need a new Bible. We don't need a new translation, though some are good. I'm not against it. We need a revelation of the Spirit And thank God we can have what we need. For God wants to reveal His Word to us by the Spirit. And may God, by His Spirit, 
give us continuous, life-giving, say life-giving, life continuous, progressive, never stopping, continuous, life-giving, and prevailing revelation. Oh, if the church could only get a fresh revelation and become it, the living word manifested, we would do the greater works and glorify God in heaven. I'm just going to stop there. How many want to do the greater works? <laughs> How many say, Lord, I want to be a spiritual believer. I want to be a spiritual church. I, want, I need a revelation from God. I, I want to go deeper in Christ. How many feel that way? I do. I want to go deeper. We've looked at he is our rock. He was David's rock. He was Moses' rock. He was Abraham's rock. He's got to be your rock tonight. He's got to be my rock. We thank God for good pastor that he has a rock, but I need a rock. You need a rock. We need a personal experience. We thank God for the prophet, and the prophet had a rock, but we can have the same rock he had. How many say, yes, Lord, tonight? Let's pray. When we pray, when we go home and pray, I want you to pray, Lord, let me see you like I've never seen you before. Let me see a true revelation of the scriptures. Let me fall in love with you all over again. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we've just taken a walk through the scriptures and dealing with divine revelation. God, it moves our hearts, Lord, just to see the promises that we have before us. How many ages it slipped through their fingers and they missed it. God, help us not to miss it. I pray, dear God, that everyone that has participated, Lord, they've read and they've helped read and they've given their attention to your word. I pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would be their portion. Every one of us here that have our heads bowed, we have a desire for more of you. I pray, dear God, that you just be our portion. Continue to reveal yourself. Continue, Lord, to open our hearts to those things that are true. Let us see Calvary like we've never seen it before. Let us fall in love with this word like never before. Give these young people, Lord, a, a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. God, we love you with all of our hearts. Lead us and guide us. Thank you for an opportunity, Lord. Thank you for a message that you've sent to this earth. Help us to be loyal to it. Help us to be faithful. We love you and we thank you for all that you are. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Would you want to stand with me and maybe we'll sing, I love him, I love him. Oh, I love him. I love him. Because he first loved me and purchased my salvation on Let's sing it again. Oh, I love him. I love him because he first loved me. 